morning. Yes, welcome everyone. Um, so this is going to be about software language repositories. That's a word I made up, so I should probably explain what it is, but it's easy to understand. So uh, there's basically a list of meta programming systems or model-driven engineering systems, right? And typically all these systems go with uh, some repository, right? Sometimes the repository is more or less just for testing the meta programming technology. Sometimes it's really meant uh, to help you learning, exploring the technology. And there are even some completely repository oriented projects. So for example, at this moment I'm visiting Professor Nakula, uh, working with Alfonso uh, Pierre and David De Rusto, and they have a project called MDE Forge, uh, which is about well, getting MDE into the cloud so that people can play with model transformations and meta models. For like Vadim well, Seitzer and me, we have worked on something with what we call software language processing suite, where we collect the grammars and all kinds of related uh, software language related components. And now uh, these days I'm working on a repository that's called YAS. So, um, yeah, YAS is basically also a software language repository. It contains lots of language definitions, transformations, you know, grammars, uh, semantics, beautiful semantics components, uh, sample artifacts, and so on. And so, basically, this is this is sort of the status of YAS. Uh, it's not super big because it's basically just everything that's needed for my lovely software language boot, which I put here, which is coming out soon. Uh, so, so there's uh, all kinds of Haskell code there, all kinds of Java, Python protocol there, and then of course lots of artifacts and domain specific notations, grammar notations, and uh, sample programs in many languages. You see there's like 107 languages going on. And, you see there's 500 something language type artifacts in the repository and um, basically all these artifacts are sort of related by transformation relationships or otherwise. And so that's basically the, the kind of context. And the research question is, what is an appropriate way to build and test such a repository? I mean, in a way, a software language repository isn't dramatically different from a normal repository for a normal software system. I think it's just a little bit nicer in the sense that you always think in terms of languages, so every file is of some language type, right? So, but I mean, as you see here, uh, different programming languages are involved. So am I supposed to uh, use all the different make, build management systems, uh, how, how much code should I write to manage all these relationships? How can I understand this, right? So, so this is basically what this work tries to improve on uh, by a domain-specific language called Uber, you know, uh, with UB. Uh, so uh, Uber because it uh, refers to mega modeling, mega models are models about uh, about models, right? So anyway, so yeah, the domain-specific language for build management and congestion testing. I'm going to talk about one of the cool things about this conference is that uh, the authors are required to write a very, as most of you know, uh, write a very structured uh, abstract, right? I, I actually really like that, you know? It's, you know, it's, it's some really deep thinking in how you should write an abstract. And so this is just you know, a short abstract of the abstract. Yeah, context is still management and testing. Um, what's the inquiry here? Well, it's basically trying to understand a repository as a graph. Uh, in the sense that the artifacts in the repository are the nodes and they are typed by languages and the ages in the graph are sort of the relationships such as conformance and transformation. The approach on the line is research, so it's an odd paper by the way, is uh, one of language design, so we try to do the, the, the final language for managing this graph if you like. And the kind of uh, knowledge that we gain is, well, we came to actually derive a declarative language for building. Fantastic. So the grammar is that we have an executable semantics for this uh, domain specific language, and then at least we have applied it to a uh, very, unfortunately, not so objective manner to, to, to our own repository, if it was an object. Um, yes, and important, I think it is because, you know, if you have 
repositories with very diverse artifacts, it's worthwhile to help people managing the consistency and understanding the relationship. So here just some quick illustrative artifacts. Uh, there's somewhere a binary number file. Yeah, so that's a basic assumption here for this repository. Everything is a file, so there's no configuration or nothing in some scripts. So it's completely file-based, right? Because files are typed by languages, so everything lives in a file. So also this binary number. And I'm just showing you apart from the paper where this artifact shows up here. I mean, this is in the paper. So, and, and by the way, when you, when you click these things in the paper, um, then, then you get online, you get to a fork of the repository that has been fixed for this publication. Um, so that's also how you see that this is really a repository-oriented approach, right? So I think this is generally very cool for reproducibility that, that people can click everything that's in a paper and can find more information. That's sort of the, the uh, let's say, the journal approach to linked open data, right? Okay. Um, right, so that's what I was showing, just in case uh, internet would work. It's also here. Well, there's also a file for the decimal representation of the binary number we just had seen. Maybe there's also a JSON representation, let's say an abstract syntax tree for the same binary number. Um, there's also a symbolic representation that already hints at how we convert binary numbers into a decimal value, right? And there's maybe an Angular grammar in a repository describing the, the language in question, I mean the syntax of the binary number language. And maybe there's also uh, somewhere BNF. Uh, grammar in the repository. So, the, so that's actually, I'm hinting here the, at the fact that in a software language repository, you might actually have alternative definitions of things, even, right? Uh, and also at different representation levels, right? So you really have uh, maybe here several parser descriptions. Of course, you also want to check them against each other and all this stuff. Um, right, and here's an algebraic signature. I mean, for the abstract syntax, this time not for JSON, but a term based algebraic uh, signature here, of course. Or here's a definite clause grammar, which is another definition of the syntax, but it also contains uh, attributes to actually construct a symbolic computation of the decimal value that we were seeing earlier. Okay? And there's also an evaluator for the symbolic uh, representation. Well, it's just is the problem is breaking, right? Okay, so you get an idea. So we have uh, some hundreds of these artifacts, semantics, grammars, and so on. And so the basic assumption is, as I said, that all the uh, artifacts in the repository are files and that they are typed by languages. So by language, I mean basically a name, right? So uh, I show you some part of the language hierarchy of the uh, Just repository. So here at the top, you have the most basic representation types that we use. So we can deal with text, we can deal with terms, because to some extent the framework uh, uses Prolog as its preferred uh, well, language, but it also supports Haskell, Python, and Java. And we can also deal with JSON, we can deal with XML, and we can also have binary blocks, if you like, right? And now we can uh, derive from this, so for example, uh, we can have term-based representations for different representations for a given language. So BNL is the binary number language. So for example, we have your BNL term for the term representation, let's say the S representation for BNL. Or here we have BNL tokens term. So this is a term-based representation of token sequences for BNL, and so on and so forth. Um, and so we can also support serialized Java objects, or we can support uh, read show based serialization for Haskell, and of course we can support JSON, and by this we can support uh, serialization for Python dictionaries and stuff like this. Okay? And then uh, we define basically uh, these ages. I mean, so what you see here in this, in this graph is basically the, the, um, the ellipsoid nodes are languages and the rectangular nodes are well functions or relationships. So so basically this is all declared in some syntax of this domain specific language, but in the end 
some graph like this is compiled that shows the relationships between all the involved languages or representation formats, right? And of course, I can also show you a big graph showing how all the artifacts in the repository are then related as instantiation of that sort of graph, right? Okay, so now the concepts of the language. So uh, again, it's called Übel. Um, so the concepts are basically about introducing languages. So we have text languages, JSON languages, XML languages, binary languages, graph languages. Um, so you give them a name. And then, of course, for each language, you should provide a membership test. So the membership test could be invocation of an Android-based parser, uh, or it could be just a black box like uh, Oracle's Java C, right? So, so anything works, right? You can use membership, tool-based, constraint-based, meta model-based, signature-based, grammar-based, and then, uh, then you actually associate artifacts with languages by saying this thing is element of that language, which means in terms of the runtime semantics of this language, eventually the corresponding membership tests need to be executed, obviously. All right, then we have also relations, that you set up relations such as conformance for XML versus XML schema or models versus meta models and so on. And then of course you also have relates to uh, declaration so that you can say, well, I think this artifact relates to that artifact, this and that, okay? And likewise, you also have functions, you can also plug functions in there, and you can say, okay, this artifact is derivable from that artifact, let's say, by that function, okay? So I, I think it's, this is actually all there is. That's a really simple domain-specific language. Um, so this is, this is the abstract syntax of the domain-specific language. So it's a term-based representation. Uh, to be honest, there is no concrete syntax, so we actually use this abstract syntax. So you see, uh, the Uber Mega model is uh, a list of declarations, and we have all these uh, kinds of declarations here. We can declare a language. We can say that something is element of something or not element of something. We can set up. Uh, so goal means you essentially plug in of, of functionality. Uh, so we can set up a membership test, we can set up a relation, and you see the relations are obviously typed by languages, right? And likewise for functions, functions are also typed by languages. And again, we can plug in some functionality for that function, and that might be a, a, a Java static method or a protocol or a, 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 some um, Haskell main function or a Python script, right? So, and then there's some more stuff, right? Um, so we don't need to look at all the details, but just to give you some ideas. So, for example, here is how I set up the basic term language, which is like the mother, I mean, the, the universal format for all prolog-like term representations. And then here's how I set up a language that sort of derives, I mean, that subsets term um, for binary number uh, as like representation, right? Or here's how we, the example we had seen, 5.25, you know, how this file is basically associated, obviously, with some language. So this is the text version of it, so we also have the PNL text language. This is, for what it matters, is um, the uh, membership uh, declaration where we essentially say, hmm, in order to decide on membership for BNL text, we are going to use uh, a top-down acceptor that interprets a certain grammar notation. So this is BGL, basic grammar language, is one of the languages defined in the repository. So, and we provide it with some uh, standard predicate. And here we point, here we point to the uh, basically to the abstract representation of the grammar that is used for BML. Okay. okay. Or here conformance. Um, we say, okay, we can uh, have conformance between a term, any term, right, and a BSL term. BSL term is for basic signature language, so it's basically the, you know, the meta model kind of format. So, yes, so we can have conformance between a term and some, let's say, signature, and well, the predicate or the functional doing this, that, that's called BSL conformance, right? And then we just say, okay, 5,25.term conforms to, 
well, the abstract syntax definition of that PNL language, okay? And there's also an example of uh, using functions in the context of parsing, it's very similar, right? And we have some input-output behavior. And uh, that's sort of it, and then on top of this, there's a little bit more convenience for defining uh, macros so that you can handle groups of declarations in some uh, reusable compact way. So, for example, here we define a macro where we just uh, say, okay, you want to apply um, a certain function to, um, to some file of a certain language, to get some file of a certain language, and then it basically generates from that three declarations. And then, for example, what you see here is a bunch of declarations of a test harness for some language of uh, dealing with pretty printing, okay? So, so we set up the test on and see we say, okay, this this pretty printer expression should be rendered as, 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 as this text, and uh, this one as this, and this one also has the same one, so on. All right, so then you get some basic idea. Um, now, how does Uber really work? I mean, semantically, uh, what's the what's sort of the runtime experience? Well, I mean, this particular approach, uh, at this point, works like this, that we can basically scatter so-called Uber files all over the repository. So, so these Uber files, they are meant to provide declarations for the nearby artifacts, right? And basically, the Uber semantics involves a stupid phase of collection, where basically all these uh, uh, declarations are gathered, you know, element of language, and all these other declarations are gathered. So then we have some well is checking in the sense about, you know, just basic static semantics that we cannot, for example, relate things with a relation symbol that doesn't exist, right? So that's called well -fortness. so that we just look at the declarations as such and check their, them for some, some uh, consistency. And then uh, that, of course, generates some, some problems, uh, maybe. Uh, and then we also have what, what, what's called verification, because eventually we really need to execute the declarations. Like, for example, we need to carry out the membership pass, uh, we need to check the relationships, and we need to uh, basically try the function applications. And that's called verification. So we, we actually check that the repository at this state really conforms to all these declarations, right? And so, oops, and then uh, we basically get into problems. So and then so so the, the thing with build management and regression testing is that we might find that some artifacts are missing, right? So because we have not yet set up a baseline, for example, for some transformation, right? Then of course we would already uh, introduce the name for the baseline, and then it will tell us what's not yet there. And well, then you can um, then we can basically force the semantics to create the baselines, and then of course we are assumed to look at the baseline and check whether this is the kind of output we want if we don't want to design it manually, right? Um, and if, if we somehow have an evolution in a repository, then it could, could also, of course also be that some relationships are violated, and then we might want to push the, uh, the evolution through the repository by basically overriding uh, some artifacts. So this is what I mean by overriding and creation uh, semantics here. Right, so what I show you here is basically some outputs of the Uber processor. So at the top, we see the scenario that we somehow have uh, changed, let's say, the pretty printing uh, implementation, and so some baseline uh, now disagrees, right? And it tells us basically also which declaration is therefore unverified. Or here we have a, the situation that we actually seem to implement a new test case and we have not yet provided the baseline because maybe it's actually too difficult to write it down manually. Okay? And so it says, okay, baseline is missing, so therefore it cannot check much, right? But we can then force it to create it. Or here is when we model a new relationship, so we seem to want to evaluate uh, binary numbers uh, to values, 
And then it turns out there is actually no such relationship uh, well, because the evaluation only works on the abstract representation. So there's no overload for that, for those types. Okay, just to give you an idea. And so as I said, um, this, this repository involves uh, mostly Haskell code, uh, also quite some open protocol code, but also significant amounts of Java code and uh, a little bit of Python code. And so the idea here is really simple, how we basically get a foreign function interface. So the idea is, uh, yeah, um, basically um, that, we, that we can represent artifacts in whatever way is convenient for the language, you know, for example, um, if when we deal with Java, we might uh, deal with serialized objects, or we might just go on the JSON or XML route, right? And um, so, so basically, we can write functionality on all these kinds of uh, representations and invoke functionality in the various uh, languages. Okay, so this is it. Uh, this is the final slide. Um, just want to point out some interesting directions for future research. So, I mean, there will be another talk on mega modeling uh, by two of my students. Well, actually, by one of my students. Um, so, and, and in general, we, we are in, in the context of mega modeling, we are also interested very much in semantic annotation in the sense of semantic web or link to open data that you better understand semantically, conceptually. What, what you are dealing with, I mean, that you really know that this is a parser or this is an evaluator, this is a big step or small step semantics, stuff like this, and that you use appropriate annotations. So we're working on this. Currently, YAS doesn't use incremental building. It's not too hard to imagine to do it. Currently, we only have uh, specific test cases, but not test data generation. Uh, that should also be added. Um, and I, I would also like to show that this approach works, of course, for some existing other repository that uses other means of uh, build management and regression testing. I mean, that should be done. Uh, we would like to more tightly integrate it with version control. Um, and maybe also we want to write less uh, declarations overall by setting up more conventions so that uh, many declarations could be inferred. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we have some time for two or three questions. Probably I missed something. But you are focusing more on grammars or at least on the syntactic part of the language. Only insofar that um, that you use them for typing, right? So that you know what what artifacts you are manipulating, but then the actual plugins for relation and for functions, these of course are typically translation semantics or operational semantics or interpreter based implementation of demotation semantics. And a software analyzes, abstract interpretation could be anything, right? So it's only that the syntax, we, we use it sort of as a type system for the repository. So that we know whether we are dealing with JSON or that we know what sort of JSON we are dealing with for, for, for. So the names of the language are sort of symbolic, right? So and, and, and so the actual knowledge about what a language really is, it's, it's sort of black box because we add membership tests. It could be implemented many different ways, right? Yeah, so. <coughs> So if I understood correctly, uh, if you want to verify the results of language processes as well, yes. can you do this also at the uh, level of the elements within the file? Um, so that one function, before it gets passed to a particular language processor, always results in a uh, function in one language? Um, I'm not really sure that I understand the question correctly. I mean, do you think about some sort of correspondence yes. between yeah. Um, and, I mean, correspondence is, is, is a term that we generally also use in mega modeling to express that there is some systematic traceability linking possible on, you know, collection of artifacts. 
and uh, and of course one is but, but, you know uh, quite nice relation. So we we could actually say you know these two artifacts, let's say some uh, XML schema and some Java object model, they correspond to each other, and then we could even um, recover the traceability links, the traceability links would also be subject to some other language, the language of traceability links, for specialized to the languages of related artifacts, so this could all be modeled, yes. Yeah. Another question? One question. You, you seem to say here that, for instance, there is one product, or there is one ANTLR, or there is but actually there are many, and so you may also want to, to have metadata to, to be able to, to say that there are variants of these languages. And so yes, that? so that's, that's a very, that should be in this list. So, so at this point, what we only can deal with is with, um, I mean, very well deal with is uh, that we have alternative, let's say, formalizations or implementations of the same language. So, for example, we have an Ambler-based uh, acceptor for, for language, we have a DCG-based acceptor for language, we have, you know, some others. Uh, but that's all about being the same language then. Um, and we have subsetting, so, so, so we can say, okay, this appears to be a subset of that, and then we, we can do some sanity checking, you know, we can infer some checks from the subset declaration. But in terms of uh, variance, we don't have a good model for that. I mean, that would be very interesting to, um, yeah, to have some deeper support for this. Yeah, that should be on this future work. Absolutely. Good point. Yep. Another question? Okay, then I propose let's thank the speaker and uh, let's go to the next talk. Thank you.